Good morning. Welcome to another installment of the Quasquicentennial uh, Redlands Celebration video interviews. I am here this morning at the Redlands Country Club. I'm Tony Mombaker of the Redlands Daily Facts, and I'm here with Carol Beswick, who has uh, made her mark on this town in a million ways that we're going to talk about, but whom I have known my entire life. Our family's friendships predated my birth, so um, I'm just excited to, to sit here and share her story with you this morning. Thank you for joining us it's this fun. morning, Carol. I interviewed Nelda a few weeks ago, and she talked about uh, writing women back into history and how she wanted to make sure in her tenure at the Redlands Daily Facts that women's accomplishments and the women leaders of our community were represented as the important figures that they were. You, your name was the first one that popped into my mind. Um, and I'll go back over these in, in more detail as we tell your story, but you were the very first woman president of a service club in Redlands, d following a time when women were not even allowed to join very quickly. Um, you were the first mayor of Redlands that was a female, and you have just become the first woman president of the Redlands Country Club, which is why we're sitting here at this time. Wow. I mean, really, you have made an impact for women in this community uh, more than any other, I'm, I'm going to assert. What, where does your story begin? My Redlands story? Yes, begins with We don't care about anything that didn't happen okay, in Redlands. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it begins with moving here when um, my husband and I were first married. We had um, uh, not known exactly where we were going to land out of college, but this is where we landed. And um, in large part because his practice was in San Bernardino. He was an attorney. He was an attorney. And I had driven through Redlands many times as a child because I went to camp in Oak Glen. So we had stopped here for ice cream or a meal or something. And I, luckily I knew about Redlands because it's been a gift to me to live here. So you settled here and uh, you were already a graduate. What was your profession? I taught school. And when I first moved here, I was teaching in San Bernardino. And I taught, so I, I always think that I had several careers. Isn't a career seven years, something like yeah. that? So my first eight were spent teaching school. I started teaching in for the city of Glendale and La, and La Crescenta, mm -hmm. and then moved here and taught in San Bernardino for a number of years. Okay. So that was my, my, first, my first career. And, and um, we lived in San Bernardino for a time when we first moved out here, but I always kind of longed for a, a, a town with the feel that Redlands had, and I'd grown up in a small town, and I thought, you know, we really want to live in Redlands. So I pitched it for nine months and finally got over here. <laughs> uh, at what point did you become mayor? How long had you lived here before you became mayor? Oh, pretty long time. Um, I, I became mayor in 1983. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was something brewing in you? Did you have a goal? Not at all. Really? No. I had no desire to run for public office. <clears throat> wasn't something that appealed. I really didn't. I just, the whole notion of, of I, no, is the answer. And the irony of it is that, that I had um, members of my family who had been in office in both Paso Robles and Oakland, or actually Alameda County. And so it shouldn't have seemed odd to me as a, as a concept, but it was not something I ever want to do, nor did I want to do it at the time. And I actually was on, was asked to serve on the planning commission. And that's, that's how this all kind of got started. Um, the, after two years on the planning commission, a group in town approached me and asked if I would run for city council. <clears throat> and I said, no, I wouldn't. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Sounds like fun, but. And then two years later, um, this is a story I, I don't get to tell often, but Ed Harp, who was at the time the CEO of Redlands Federal Savings and Loan, mm -hmm. asked me to his office one day, um, gave me no indication of what he wanted. But I had told people, as I was asked again, <clears throat> that I just couldn't imagine it. I wouldn't know how to begin. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to raise money, you have to organize events, you have to have a campaign. I just, no, couldn't yeah. imagine it. So Ed had me to his office, and I walked in, and there were about seven people in the room, or eight. And he sat me down and he said, this is true, you've decided to run for city council. And I said, have I now? <laughs> and he said, yes, and everyone around this room has taken a job to make that work. So this one's going to raise the money, and this one's going to organize the, the actual um, 
visual part of the campaign, and this one's going to figure out how to host God. They had gone, he had, and so I it sort of took all the wind out of my I, I can't run sales because all the things that I had thrown up as barriers were now, you know, taken down. And so they all sat there and waited. And I, my only answer was, well, I need to talk to my family. <laughs> and actually, that had already happened too, the little devils. Oh, wow. Yeah, what a show so support. It really was huge. And, and it made it a, a remarkable experience because I literally had this astonishing support system already in place, and they all did what they said they'd do. And you won your first time that you bid for it? Mm -hmm. How long did you serve on the council? Eight years. Okay. And four of those years were six, six of those years. Six, six of those years. Right. At the sixth year, um, two of my friends and I opened a business, and there was no way I could envision starting a new business and being a responsible mayor. Paper partners. Paper partners. Well, who were your partners? Ann Skog and Pat Kaiser. They remain two of my closest friends to these days, but we had a 15-year run of paper partners. Yeah. Printed my wedding invitation. Yes, we did. And lots of others. <laughs> we always knew ahead of time what was going on in town. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, while during your tenure as mayor, uh, you did two, two or three of the things that I contend you're most memorable, remembered for. Okay. Um, the bike classic, obviously. Right. And uh, the centennial, mm -hmm. and uh, revamping the downtown area. Let's start with the bike classic. Okay. This is a biggie. This is a worldwide biggie. Right. Okay. How did you get the idea for this? Are you a cyclist? Not at all. Um, okay. I enjoy telling this story from time to time, too. Uh, when I first was elected, uh, so we're talking about uh, 82, late in 82. So 1983, I was invited to a conference of mayors. It wasn't those. No, it wasn't mayors. A conference about... Um, historic downtowns. Mm -hmm. When I when I ran for office, one of my key pieces was we have this amazing downtown and we're letting it fall apart. It's decaying before our eyes, and it's it's one of our most important and identifying pieces. So, in order to keep our town vibrant and our sales tax base strong and to attract people here to spend their money, we need to do we need to do something about it. Um, it's a unique resource. A lot of communities don't have a downtown. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of no there there. We have this, it's like our family room. This is yeah. where we gather and we do things and we celebrate and we have events. So that was in my mind as I went to this conference. And the conference was held in New York. There were two people from, potentially two people from every state. And it was meant for cities of a population of less than 40,000. That tells you how we've grown since then because we've doubled. That had an old downtown that was in distress. And it was a totally funded, I paid nothing, the city paid nothing. Really? No. It was, it was put on by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Department of Agriculture, the Na Federal Home Loan Bank. I mean, there were like 10 sponsors. The other participant from California was a, a planner from the city of Escondido. So it was held in Ithaca, New York, and it was a week-long, hands-on, we got to go into old buildings in New York and see what could make them better. How do you, how do you preserve a structure? How do you um, take something that's falling into neglect and make it a viable building again and an asset to the community? And it was such a fun experience. It was just fascinating to talk to these people from all over the country. You know, somebody in Nebraska has slightly different issues than we do in Southern sure. California, but, but we had a lot in common. During uh, this uh, conference, the 1984 Olympics were occurring. And so I would hustle back to cause think of the time change. And they were in LA. And my family was going to some events. And I'm, I'm there thinking, oh, I could be home at gymnastics or whatever. Oh. But I was watching these each night. And, um, and what struck me were the, were the cycling events, which were being held in the Laguna Niguel. And you know the hills and all the rest. And so that was just sinking into my subconscious. Meanwhile, I'm going to these, each day of the conference, these uh, different sessions about how to attract people to your downtown. And you should have a marketing piece, you should have a coherent design, you should have a place that people want, it should look good, it should have wonderful facades and so on. So one day, the, the speaker was um, talking about um, design and how to have things that, are, that make your, you know, have banners, have posters, have, um, and have a coherent 
logo effect, you know, brand yourself and mm -hmm. so on. And he had brought with him samples of his work. He was a marketing person. And he had posters on the wall of the room that we were meeting in. One of the posters was of the Inland Empire Bicycle Classic. And I thought, isn't that odd? I've never, I didn't know we had a bicycle race. It wasn't even classic. Didn't know we had a bike race in the Inland Empire. That's really interesting. So I go over to him after the, and I said, where does this happen? I, I live in the Inland Empire. And he said, oh, do you live in Spokane? Well, there's a second Inland Empire in this world. Oh! <laughs> and in, in uh, <clears throat> eastern Washington, and they call themselves in the Spokane region the Inland Empire. So there was indeed this bike race. Seed number two, can't yeah. watch in the Olympics, now this guy. And then from my history of uh, being involved in events and, and competitive events, which is a whole other story for another time, I started thinking about how we could market downtown Redlands if we had an event. And oh, by the way, um, cycling happens on streets. You don't need a big, expensive venue. You don't need an arena. Yeah. Right. You don't need a stadium. You don't need all of those pieces. So on my way home from the, as I was making my notes, because I felt like I had to really make a report back to the council, I wrote a whole sort of, this is what, how about if we did this? Mm -hmm. And our city manager at the time, John Holmes, was, you know, yeah, let's look at that. That's an interesting idea. Oh, and by the way, there's a guy named Peter Brandt, who's a member of our Rotary Club, and he's spoken to me about, could we have a bike race in Redlands? Were you a member of Rotary at this I wasn't. Time? But let's get, let's get all those brains in the same room. And then another council member who had been elected when I was, was Dick Larson, who went on to be our county treasurer, and then now he's, he's retired. But he was involved. So the four of us met and talked about what a bike race might look like in Redlands. And the rest is sort of history. We, because of Peter's knowledge of cycling, and understanding how um, you, there's a whole structure and a whole uh, organization and a whole governing body for cycling. So m my strength, I guess, was I knew how to put together an event and, and came away feeling like we could market this thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then feeling like I knew the town because one of the things that's very unique about our bike race is that cyclists stay with families, yeah. just unheard of. And it was a hard sell to start with. You know, these teams, these professional teams are like, really? You're going to stay in, you know, some kid's bedroom? Yeah. And it's really one of the most sort of renowned things about our race. And there are so many families who for years and years have stayed in touch with, and I've had cyclists stay, you know, we had them stay with us. And it, it's a really special part of it. So that's that's where the inspiration for the Reynolds bike race came. And I didn't know that you weren't supposed to call yourself a classic until you were one. Oh. <laughs> but uh, but we had, at the time, there was an event called the Coors Classic happening in Colorado mm -hmm. and all over. And uh, they were gracious enough to let me come and observe and learn. And, and Mike Eisner shared lots of information with me. I made great contacts there. So we just came home and named ourselves the Redlands Bicycle Classic. Yeah. Now we are one. <laughs> yes. But that's how it all began. So tell me about the first one. Memorial Day weekend, 1980. Was it five now? I guess. And um, it was three day, a three-day event, hot, smoggy, um, but we attracted, it was, it's, uh, what, what we didn't know was that road races are uniquely, um, how they, they're not commonly held. It's not the easiest thing in the world for cycling to get the permission and the permits and all that they need to do to use city streets to have an event. So the U.S. Cycling Federation was very excited that we were interested, and um, and they made sure that we had a good field. Um, Craig Kundig and Peter had a lot of great contacts, and um, and Peter had been talking about this a while, so he was able to um, to to parlay his contacts in in the world of cycling to get contenders here. Did they own a bicycle store in Reynolds at the time? No, uh, Craig did. Peter Peter's a physical therapist, and he had physical therapy. Um, practice. Okay, but Craig had Craig had Redlands bike, bike shop. Yeah, was it was some it had a different name at the time, but I think it was called. It was a Schwinn store, I think, at oh, the time. Now and he still owns Cycle the, USA. Yes, yeah. he still has a, has bike shops. So um, we began meeting. We figured out the pieces we need. We need, you know, a lot of volunteers. When you're going to have a race on city streets, you need to have every intersection with a person present to make sure it's safe. Um, we had to work with the highway patrol, with Caltrans, with, 
I, I, other cities. I, ultimately, we didn't the first year because the first year we held it all in Redlands. But as we realized that this was highly desirable to cyclists, that we could attract, you know, the best of the best in cycling to our community, we began looking at, at you know, how to. So we've done things like go to Oakland, go to. We still routinely go to Beaumont Banning, um, and it, it's it's a. It's it's a. The cycling is its own culture. Now, I know you were neck deep in it, the first few, especially from my perspective as a 16, 17 year old when the first one came. It was, it was the biggest thing in the world. It was really the cyclists came and we met them. I worked at Elgato Gordo at the time and they came in and I met three or four of them that I later saw throughout the week sure. uh, at other events and, and became friends with. And we all went. I had no interest in or knowledge of bicycles. Exactly. Neither did I. But we were there. We got up. We took our lawn chairs, and there were fireworks and a dance. I remember one night during the. We used to have a, we used to have a street dance and yes, carbo loading dinner. We had a lot of different things happen over the years. I one of the one of the most satisfying things for me is how many children who aren't children anymore, i.e., you, say to me, "Oh gosh, I used to race in the public races." And and the, what we liked about cycling was the accessibility of, of the of the actual competitors, and the fact that you can stand five feet, two feet, one foot away from what's going on. I mean, you're right at the fence. Mm -hmm. These guys are zooming by you, making a noise you didn't know bicycles could make, and um, and they they always make themselves accessible to school children, um, to hospitals. I mean, they're they're very. Um, it, I, I think that cyclists understand the stressors that having an event puts on a community. So they really try to be um, appreciative of that and, and to give to in any way they can to the community. They show up and it makes it easier for the people organizing the events to put them on. So yes, yeah, so I stayed involved for 20 years. Wow. And I thought, you know, if it's not gonna make it without me now, it's, oh well. <laughs> Who are some of the biggest names that have come to Redlands? Oh, don't do that to me. Oh, okay. Um, Davis Finney. Uh, Bob Roll, oh my gosh, I hate it when this happens. Oh, we could take it out, never mind. Uh, well, I mean, there are so many, really there are many Olympians and, and people who, who competed in the, in the Tour de France mm -hmm. and the Giro and all the, the really big races have come, to, have come to Redlands. And I've had experiences, probably the, the most distant one, I was in Amsterdam one time and it was, it was raining and I had put on a, a jacket that had a Redlands Bicycle Classic thing on it. Mm -hmm. And my husband was a cyclist, and we walked into a cycling shop just because he was curious. And the man that ran the shop saw my jacket and turned around. He had posters from our race on the wall of his bike shop in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, wow! And Jerry Lewis, our congressman, used to have posters of you know in his office in Washington, and and people what a would proud moment for you. Oh, you know it. it I it's a, I it's sort of a little. Uh, uh, this happened to me just this week. I'll say to somebody, they'll ask me where I'm from, and I'll say, I'm from Redlands, and they'll say, oh, I know where that is. Um, gee, you're, you're sort of like, you're at a distance from home. No, I'm not talking about Redding. Oh, I happen to be all talking about Redlands. And the mayor of Redding uh, was, happened to be a woman when I was mayor. We used to laugh about, I told her that I was going to rename the lake at Ford Park, Lake Shasta. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we exchanged a lot, of, a lot of jokes over the years. but. Um, but I'll tell you, nobody's confused about where the Redlands Bicycle Classic is. I mean, in cycling, we are on the map for all eternity. I mean, we it, we will always be a big deal. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'd meet cyclists in Colorado, for instance, and they'd say, oh, I, I really, God, I'd love to win your race, or I'd love to win a stage in your race. or And I, and it's it, stage races are, are a unique animal, and the fact that we've been able to perpetrate a stage race, <laughs> perpetrate's not quite the right word, but perpetuate would be, a stage race for as many years as we have in our community is is huge. We're the longest standing stage race in the country. Really? We're the longest continuous stage race in the country. Now for Redlanders who don't really cycle or follow cycling, mm -hmm. um, it has a different place in our hearts, I think, because as you said, we raced as children. Sure. And our children raced as sure. children. My son was in it. So my grandson won a gold medal one time. Oh, hey. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's it's something that does include well, I, I, the fact that that they come to the community and actually move in quite literally. Mm -hmm. I think has created a bond that 
that any other community would have. When I was in office, occasionally I'd get a call, would you come to name a town and tell us how to get a bike, bike race going here and how do we, because how, how's it such a phenomenal success, what are you credited to and what have you. And it's like a lot of other things about Redlands. Um, it's, it's about the people and, and you can't just plunk down somewhere and make it happen in the same way. This town is uniquely willing to participate and volunteer and be a part. I mean, you mentioned the, the centennial. So many, uh, so many things happened during that year that would not have been possible at all had it not been for just this huge cadre of people who are willing to just, oh yeah, come, where should I show up? Well, we're gonna give you a free apron. Okay, good, I'll be there, or a t-shirt. Uh -huh. I mean, all these hundreds, I mean, over the years, I can't even imagine how many volunteers have worked in the bike race. I mean, I, I mean it's a tons of thousands in terms of, of, of volunteer spots. Probably some of those people have been volunteering for 25 mm -hmm. or 30 years, but, but they'll do it for a t-shirt. They'll do it for a free dinner at the Spaghetti Factory. I mean, they'll, they'll just... Um, they'll do it to be included on the list of volunteers. It's exactly right. To do it. Or they'll do it as a family. Yeah. You know, well, my kids and I will come. Or, well, I can't come that day. That's the day we have our big barbecue in the front yard to watch the riders go by. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's really a, a phenomenon in this town. And it's not... So I would go and talk to somebody, a community in Arizona, let's say, and I'd say, well, the first thing you're going to need is 350 volunteers. And that would usually stop them cold. Oh. I don't know how we do that, you know. Yeah. So, um, and you'd need, and especially if it's a, a remote town with not, like we have, no big hotel, and you might have to house them in your homes. Really? <laughs> so you're going to invite seven strangers into your house who can teach you how to house a home? And you just have to, it's just unique here. Yeah. Okay, so the centennial you mentioned. Right. What were the events that Redlands had to celebrate? Well, there were, oh my gosh, again, I'm not sure I can name them all, but probably one of the most memorable was we had a Thanksgiving dinner on State Street that ran from one end to the other. It really served thousands of people. And um, that was the one, you know, you got the free apron if you were, if you were serving. Um, I still have my souvenirs from that. So many people do. Yeah. Um, my son moved recently, and the woman that, that in the house next to where he lived came over one day when we were moving him in, and she said, I wanted to show you my centennial, she had her centennial book still. Mm -hmm. And there was a... The song book or the... Uh, oh, no, this one was just a book about this, all the events oh, of the uh -huh. centennial, and there was a, you know, a, a greeting from the mayor sort of thing in the front with my photo. And here it is, how many years later she had me sign it. <laughs> That's so sweet. It's so sweet she still had it, and that it mattered and cared, but oh my gosh, people... Um, really do remember those events. I mean, we have an amazing 4th of July celebration every year. But I mean, that one was, you know, in spades because it was it was the centennial year. We did, everybody, th that was the other nice thing is that, that sort of every imaginable organization had something to commemorate that, mm -hmm. that time. And, um, and credit to, uh, Larry Burgess was the chairman of that event and the Thanksgiving dinner? No, the oh, centennial, oh, the celebration which went on for a year. And I mean, I can't even remember. It was one event after another. It was almost exhausting. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was, it, it's how Redlands does things. Uh, we, we tend to really get behind ourselves mm -hmm. and celebrate. And um, we think we're pretty special. I know, because we are. <laughs> So, um, so the Thanksgiving dinner, whose idea was that? Was that Larry's? You need to talk, yeah. Have you interviewed Larry yet? No, it's Fe February 8th. Right? Well, he's the man to, to tell you about all the centennial events because I showed up for virtually all of them, but, but remembering them one by one is, is hard to do. Um, but it just seemed like there was one thing after another, and it, and it was another case of involving the whole community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what's magic about Redlands. Um, that's something that you, you wouldn't ask me because you probably wouldn't know about, but um, I spent a good chunk of my, my years uh, performing in musicals at the, at the Bowl. I was going to segue <laughs> into that. Well, so we, uh, and I started out as a, a chorus member in a production of um, The Fiddler on the Roof. And what kept me coming back was that it was this fun. You did it. I did it. I mean, it was this, Michelle did it, my daughter, mm -hmm. it was, and my son Brad. It was this fun, I mean, what you were doing, what show it was almost didn't matter. It was this whole big family that you created during the, whatever the production was. 
and and we would work ourselves to death and spend our own resources on what we had to, to you know whether it was costume pieces or props or what have you to to spend three nights or sometimes fewer performing for literally thousands of people just for the joy of, of again getting this it was this whole community thing it was just so much fun so uh, while I was the mayor my friend Paul Little cast me as a dolly and hello dolly which w was was sort of um, there were there were lots of funny little pieces about that but but it was another magical moment I keep using that word but it, there's this just unbelievable experience to being a part of a town like this. And I don't think there are many like them. When we were uh, having the very first meeting of the Huasco Centennial Committee, mm -hmm. in fact it was a pre-meeting, I think it was just um, Paul Foster and Tabitha Johnson with right. me, and me and Carl, and uh, there might not have been more people in the room. But what we talked about was something I didn't know, and I feel stupid having not had an awareness of this because I've lived in other places during college, but this is people's hometown. People who live here consider this their hometown. Right. People from other towns don't consider their hometowns their hometowns. Right. <laughs> so there's, right. A, there's a distinction where this is a hometown community. Mm -hmm. It really so. is. It's, it's, and it's, it probably in some ways has a Midwestern sensibility about it. And maybe that's because we were founded by Midwesterners. You know, maybe it's just, I always laugh and say it's in the water. You know, it's, it's got to be something that's our drinking water. Because um, people, people, it, it, they, there's not a, people don't question that it's part of what they're going to do here. Um, there was a time when there was an Air Force base here, mm -hmm. right? Our, our neighbors, Norton Air Force Base. <clears throat> and I was mayor at the time that, well, they were, during the, the, the time that it was still active, and I, had the pleasure of doing a lot of things with the Air Force and traveling with them and learning about the whole thing because I was willing to spend the time. But many of the officers at Norton Air Force Base lived in Redlands mm -hmm. and would talk about the uniqueness because they were they were living all over the place, you know, two years here and four years there. But, and I, I think, and, and Nelda and, and Monty are an example because I believe yes. Monty was at Norton. Yes. And they, the, a lot of Nor uh, Air Force retirees came back here and chose it as their home even after they went off to other places again because of what they experienced while they were here. And they were the soccer coaches and, the, and in the productions at the bowl or the volunteers at, at family service or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they realize, I think when, you, when you're in a, a transient uh, situation such as moving around with the military, you probably learn quickly to put down roots as quickly as you can when you're in a community so that you can have that experience for yourself and your family. So they were, it was a, a loss when Norton closed, but also there are a lot of retirees here who, who recognize this is a special place. Okay, I'm going to go back. You said you were at a convention for oh, rebuilding downtown. Right. Downtown Redlands. Between when I was 10 and when I was 20, it became a very different place. A different place. Um, you, you initiated a, a complete refurbishing. And I know we got the little, the lights, we got the bricks. There's so much to talk about. Um, just to, to talk about history a little bit, I know that State Street was modeled after when it was built and named after State Street in Chicago. Right. How much did you try to hold to that uh, um, almond? Homage. <laughs> you know, not so much. We weren't as focused on on somewhere else as we were in what um, what we had in place. Mm -hmm. We were on the verge of losing downtown. It was going to be gone because it was it wasn't it was becoming less and less viable, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that could have meant more demolition and more um, building of something new that wouldn't necessarily have been better. So. The National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is, I mentioned earlier, was recognizing that around the country, downtowns were starting to disappear. Or not, there are, once something isn't viable anymore, you know, people kind of move on. And when you drive around Southern California, there are a lot of communities that are one strip mall after another. And so we, as a, uh, what was 
part of what I campaigned on when I ran because it was, it, frankly, it was why I was willing to run. Mm -hmm. And it, it partly evolved out of my planning commission years and looking at zoning and looking at what, what the community consisted of. And um, I credit Ken Roth and the council he led just before the one that I came on with recognizing that we had to do something. We had a redevelopment agency. They hired a city manager with some redevelopment experience, brought him on board. So for me, it was just good timing and a passion about it. Now, having said that, it was a huge struggle at the time because to do what we wanted to do meant we had to use um, eminent domain. We had to move some people. Who? Uh, we had to move Redlands Glass. We had to move, um, yikes, Franklin. Um, Auto. We um, bought their buildings and bought, built them new ones, and it was um, very stressful. And 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 these were people's livelihoods that we were talking about. Where were the businesses on Orange Street? Okay. And I think if you talk to either of them at this point, they would tell you that it was for the best. They got wonderful new facilities that we were, and, and we we did everything from helping them market where they were moving to to helping them find their location and design it, so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But still, we were, we were potentially, you know, we were impacting people's livelihood. This mm -hmm. was how these people made a living. And so to come in and say, you know, we just like you to move your business. Well, that's, that's not so, and especially, they, both of them had been there quite a long time. Um, well, what did you put there? We built um, the place where Trader Joe's and bonds and what have you is. Mm -hmm. So we knew we needed to keep State Street intact. We knew we wanted downtown to continue to feel like a destination. We wanted to try and keep as much character and charm as we could. So we did a design of street and hardscape. You mentioned the bollards. That's the name for those little short lights. My cat calls them light hydrants. Everybody had a name for them. <laughs> Some weren't so flattering. Oh. <laughs> But they're technically bollards, and they're meant to kind of define where cars are supposed to be and where pedestrians are supposed to be. We put in the benches, we put in the, and we ripped up State Street, took it down to the uh, literally 14 feet down, and we wow. and we had a contract with people to do it that they could only work at night. So in the daytime, State Street had to be completely usable, passable. You had to be able to get to stores. You had to be able to, it was, it was a nightmare yeah, in some a, ways. that's a big order. And it was very hard on them, very stressful on the people who were in business on State Street. And we did everything we could to help them, including going there and shopping ourselves. Um, How long did it last? Like oh, that? gosh, I don't remember. It was long. It probably was, it may, it may not have been as long as it felt, but it was a long, it was, it was a long time. Um, I wish I could remember it. That's an interesting question because... They had to replay. What happened is, when you get into something that's 100, an infrastructure that's 100 years old, mm -hmm. one of the things that was discovered they, when they started digging in State Street is that the laterals from out of those buildings for sewer were had been clay pipe. And I say it in the past tense because there wasn't any pipe left. Oh. Everything was basically flowing through a dirt hole. So the project kept getting bigger. Well, it, it, we kind of we kind of sensed that this kind of stuff was going on, but it just took a little longer than we thought it might, mm -hmm. because we had to create all new laterals for all those buildings and all the infrastructure had to be redone. The sidewalks were so heaped up by trees, we had to take trees out, we had to cut roots down. We wanted to preserve those ficus trees, and yet they were heaving up the sidewalks, and we had to put in. I didn't know some of the stuff existed. I learned. I used to laugh and say when I was when the city council and the mayor, I learned so many completely unmarketable skills yeah. <laughs> and, and information. But we had to do um, root shields, you know, so because what had happened too is the roots had grown into the sewer laterals, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you don't need to know all this detail, but <clears throat> that, that made it a longer, a little bit slower, more complicated project. The other thing we had to deal with was, um, we used to say that, um, our, one of the sayings I learned was that a, a street like State Street was at the time was like a smile with a lot of missing teeth mm -hmm. because we had so many vacant. We had a 40% vacancy rate on State Street when we started the project. So we had a lot of empty storefronts. In the mid-80s, oh, early yeah. 80s. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, there was a perception that there wasn't any parking, the place didn't look nice, the sidewalks were heaped up, et cetera, et cetera. And 
most if not all of the landlord, not all, many of the landlords were out of town. They didn't know that they owned property in Redlands. When we started writing them and saying, we have this program we'd like to involve you in, we had a program where we would help you restore your facade to its original look. Mm -hmm. We would pay for the design. We would pay a portion of the project work. We'd support you in every way we could to make your storefront look like it used to, bring it back, or just clean it up. And that still exists, doesn't it? I don't know. I, I doubt it because redevelopment money's gone. Okay. So, <clears throat> and we literally, I mean, I literally was on the phone. We all of us were. We had a, we had a downtown woman, a woman that ran the downtown project. And, and a redevelopment agency that, that was interested. And I mean, we would call people up. We would find them on the, on the property records and say, so I'm calling you from, you know, I'm Mayor Bazaway from da 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 da, and you own 112 State Street. And oftentimes it really would be, I do. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I guess that my family, yeah, maybe we do. I don't know why, why are you calling? Well, we have this problem, why would we care? Will you have tenant, or you have nobody in it, we're looking at, I mean, sometimes it took that kind of thing. So some things ended up getting sold. People were interested, but it um, over time it really it, it really had an impact. And we were able. I worked. I met a, an architect, a historic preservation architect, who's in San Francisco at that conference in New York. And he um, greatly discounted his work. He came down and he did the design. So if you if if we got, he had. I mean, he was the guy. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and he actually ultimately helped us too as we added to the light when we expanded the library, which was another project from that era. We wanted to make sure it looked historically accurate and so that when you went to the building, and you wouldn't say, and this is when they added on to the library. Yeah. You know? So, um, so it, it takes somebody that, whose specialty is historic preservation architecture. So all of those pieces fell into place. I told you about the marketing piece. You know, we came up with a uh, uh, the, the Redlands Sushi, our yes. Redlands, what came out of that. Um, actually, the redevelopment logo that has ultimately become the city logo kind of came out of that era and so on. So, although that was on the, it wasn't that it didn't, it was on the floor of City Hall, but it became the logo for the redevelopment agency. Now, you were changing things, and if I know the people at Redlands, <laughs> it didn't go over so well. Half of the people got to yeah. complain. That you're not changing, either they don't want change, or you're not changing it in a way that they like. Did we, you encounter any Oh, that? oh, hell. We had some very heated meetings. We had some very uh, intense, I'll describe them, public meetings. We actually had a couple occasions where they felt that there ought to be police present. There was sort of a sense that I might be at some kind of risk because I was leading the way on something that was aggravating and irritating mm -hmm. and angering people. And there were very strong feelings, very strong. And we did a lot of workshops, and we did a lot of public hearings, and we did a lot of things out in the public where we could, you know, try and allay people's fears or help them understand what we were trying to do. And it was, um, there were naysayers and people who were angry, and you're absolutely right, and they were inconvenienced, and they were uh, business people who wouldn't talk to me, et cetera, et cetera. Here's, I learned a number of seminal lessons during that. Uh, but probably my favorite story that I will tell you is that I consider it a success when other people take credit for it. And that's oh. what's happened over the years. People got, you know, I mean, in, in that it's, you know, it's, it's our downtown and we did this and we did that. And, and I think, you know, at the time it was, where were you? <laughs> I didn't, yeah. see, didn't see you standing behind me at the time. And uh, some of my own colleagues on the city council weren't as supportive. But um, sometimes you have to have a, a vision and you have to have the courage to, risk take a little bit and and um, I think the secret is knowing where you're going I mean having a goal that you can envision mm -hmm. and I and for me it helped a lot to have been to that conference and have seen what other cities have done the hands-on experience we had in Ithaca made a difference to me um, all of that gave me the courage of my convictions and then what things did you have to fight for what decisions did you have to Oh, yeah. people didn't. The, people don't like change. I mean, we were tearing down a lumber mill, and the, the, the Dill family mm -hmm. had, you know, all the, but it was, it had become not the right place for a lumber mill, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I um, Dill lumber. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, they moved, if you recall, it to Redlands Boulevard, and so on. I mean, 
life has changed and things have evolved and and um, gosh I remember at the time we were trying to attract a, a department store to downtown Redlands and almost everyone we spoke to except one is no longer in business because life has changed it's evolved I mean there is no more Robinsons there's no more yeah. May Company there's no more I Magnum there's no more Bullocks etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. Um, we talked to Nordstrom they're still around because it was a different model but so the whole notion of what works has changed. A big box has made a difference. But our conviction, and it remains mine to this day, is that if you offer people something unique in a, in a place where they can come to a, a cool environment mm -hmm. and have an experience of shopping with a person rather than something impersonal, it'll succeed. Yeah. So. OK, on the corner. <laughs> that I and my stubbornness continue to call the Maxwell Means Building. Um, it was later Modern Home Relics. Oh, right, and right. I think now it's Comet it Quest, the and they're changing their name to a shop called Quest, and I'm one of those people. That's a, that's a tough one. I can accept that. change, but I, have to, I need a minute. That building is it's, it's very, that's a difficult building. That's a difficult building, and, and I remember a period where it was going to be the Redlands Mini Mall. Right. And it was, um, that's right. there was white marble, on it, and I, I do remember my 12 or 13 year old ears were picking up comments saying, "What well, that white marble doesn't fit in with the, the style of the other areas, and, and a Redlands Mini Mall, and I don't ever remember people saying, let's go down to the Redlands Mini Mall, it's a great success. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, when you look at what does succeed, it it's usually people with a, with a creative idea that that are willing to, it's a risk to be in this. I mean, I, I know, I, I did it. Mm -hmm. um, to, to be a, a, an independent retailer is challenging. You know, it's it's hard to do. I, I wouldn't have and couldn't have done it alone. I admire the people who can. I was lucky to have two great partners who, we trusted each other, we had similar sensibilities and likes, and, and but it but it's it's not easy. But you're, you're right, people don't want to, people, People like to come, uh, uh, after we finished State Street, here's mm -hmm. my example of that. When it was done, um, the city manager and I, and sometimes another staff member or something. And or who another, was the city manager? John Holmes was his name. We would go over and have lunch on State Street or take a walk. Mm -hmm. And we'd stop people and ask them why they were there, where they were from. And I bet you today, if you walked down State Street and stopped somebody or saw someone sitting on a bench and said, you know, why are you here? Or are you visiting? Are you? Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed how many people come from just to come and enjoy State Street. <laughs> I occasionally do a man on the street where I have a question and I want to go get Redlanders answers. Right. You're right. I'm not I Redlanders. <laughs> I'm not from here. I'm, I'm from Hammond. I'm just I'm here from... for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. They're not Redlanders. All right. Uh, there's a shop I like to come to here. Or I actually more than once ran into people who said, "I just like to come sit down. I just come sit in your mm -hmm. because I love your downtown." Talk to me about the bricks. The bricks. The bricks. That was controversial too. It all was. Um, why did we put bricks? Is that what you're asking no, me? No, the, the project to me is um, wonderful. I love to walk down. To, and how many times have I walked down State Street since those bricks were put in? Mm -hmm. I never look around. I gotta read all oh, the names, names on the bricks. Right. And the, is mean, your name on a brick? Too? My name is not on a brick, and it's a huge regret for me. I know my mother has said a number of times, "How, how did we not well, get we our family's names on a brick?" We need to do it again somewhere. We need to have another place. I, they did it at the, um, at the. I know the Bull Associates. I think did some tiles or bricks. Yes, at, at the Mission Gables at house. At the Mission Gables house. Yeah, and I don't have one there. Darn it! I need a brick somewhere. Yes, you do. Well, we should give you another opportunity. Um, I laughed because I told them I thought the contractors were so mad at me at the end of the project that they were going to turn my brick upside down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it is fun to look to, to, I mean, there are people who are gone, people so, who moved away. What was the project? It was, a, it was a fundraiser. Why did we, what were we raising funds for with the bricks? You had to pay extra to have the brick. I can't remember what we were raising money for. Uh, don't even, it was $25, as I recall, uh -huh. to have. Oh, oh, yeah, I think that money went to the downtown, to the to the association. I, somebody may correct me on this, but I think we um, used it to fund the work that we wanted to do in promoting downtown. Okay. Um, 
that's my recollection of it. And and again, I, you know, have you ever seen the map? No. There exists a map of where everybody's name is downtown. And you didn't have to put your name on it. You could get no, you could put anything. You could put a, somebody else's name or a saying or you could put whatever you wanted phone to. Phone number. Right. For a good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, it's, it's still fun to, to walk and, and, and see those bricks. And maybe if I had it to do over again, would I have put real bricks in the intersections? No, I wouldn't have because some of them popped out. And, and what happened that bothered me is that they put asphalt in those holes instead of replacing the bricks. And I, it was an economic thing or what have you. And so I appreciate that a recent city council has reconstructed some of those intersections and done the stamp concrete. It looks great. It still has the same, we were just trying to be really authentic at the mm -hmm. time, but it, it probably wasn't for, for, you know, you don't think about, I mean, you do think about things in the long term, but, um, I, I'm sure when, when the folks built the, the Procellus at the Bowl, they weren't saying, well, you know, in 100 years, they're still going to just love this, and, it's, and it'll be, you know, an, an initial, you know, a huge character of our community, but, but it is. And it is. so we're lucky that we've had people who had the vision to, to build with character and with style and not just throw up tilt-ups, you know. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I think that it's, it, it's what makes Redlands special. Uh, can I can I boast about another thing Please that matters do. to me uh, as an outgrowth of my trip to Washington? We came back and started looking at facades and and got discussing how important the uh, architecture of Redlands was to the character of our town. And remember, I'd been a planning commissioner, mm -hmm. and so we got discussing Larry Burgess and I think Ron Halbron, Joan, Joan Dots, and some of us. Planning commissioners too, talking about you know, um, if somebody in Redlands wants to rip down a what we would consider an historic structure, mm -hmm. there's nothing to stop them. Mm -hmm. They could just do it. And um, so we started looking at the city's general plan and why doesn't it address historic preservation? And so that launched a project that we did took a bit of time. Some of the names I just named were on the committee that, that worked on this. Bill um, Schindler, who was our planning director at the time, and John Holmes. And we hired some people from Claremont, called the Aegis was their name, I believe. And they came to Redlands and did a survey of our historic structures of our whole town. And came to us and said, are you kidding me? You have no preservation mechanism? You could teach an architectural history course in this town. Really? Are you guys nuts? You need to do something because you could lose it. Mm -hmm. And well, and somebody had taken down the Casa Loma Hotel. Well, not the Casa, no, the, the facade, the La one where Posada. the mall is, the La Posada. And they just bulldozed it and put the mall there. Exactly. So no, no, no respect for what it yeah. looked like or what it represented or what it entailed or what it contributed to the old the original contemporary club of Hawaii don't start me on the things that got torn down for that mall okay so you put the brakes on it so we said well wait a minute let's let's take a deep breath and we need to put into our general plan the importance of stuff we, we had we needed ordinances we needed all the pieces we needed a general we needed a historic preservation element in our general plan so we did it wrote it went through the process, it, it takes a lot of time. These folks in Claremont, who were great, uh, helped us construct it all. And um, and then we created historic neighborhoods. I mean, we just went into this whole, so if you drive around Redlands now, you'll occasionally see a sign designating an historic neighborhood. We um, protected the cut stone curbs mm -hmm. and walls. Um, so, so now, if you want to, you know, you can't just, take an historic looking structure and say, you know, I think I'll plaster it over. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll make this look like a Cape Cod. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's part of what makes this town unique and charming and beautiful and a joy to drive through and, or walk through even more so, since that's my, my pleasure. So we were taking it for granted all those years. So that, I feel really good that we were able to put in place something that, that ultimately will. And I, and I had the joy of being able to go to a whole lot of dedications of, of historic neighborhoods, you know, because I would go and sort of cut the ribbon, you know, not, you know, yeah, sure. metaphorically to, to, um, 
And, and people are proud of their neighborhoods and proud of, of how things look and of their homes. And I kind of feel like we've, we've dropped that ball a little bit. It's been a while since we've designated an historic neighborhood, and we should probably do that again. So that's, that's a piece that I, just comes to mind as we're talking about preserving downtown. It also just kind of then morphed into preserving, looking at the whole community. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump topics completely here. We are at the Country Club. We are. Tell me a little bit place. about the history of the Country okay. Club. Well, we are one of the oldest country clubs, as I think you know, um, from uh, certainly west of the Mississippi. There are photos in our Country Club, in the wall of this room that we're sitting in, that show ladies playing golf in big hats and long dresses. Do you know the exact distinction? Because I think we're the oldest, oldest country continuous, club. Continuous, 900, and there are a few Okay, the qualifications. There are few qualifiers. But if you put the right adjectives in there, we're the oldest yeah, one. Okay. Yes, if you, if, you get, if you get the qualifiers right. Um, and and if, you, if you look at, I'm, I'm looking around the room to see if there is anything, but um, like the menu and the napkins and all the things here. Uh, Make, make note of that fact. And if you, if you looked out onto the golf course, what, one of the reasons that this course is so sensational and has so much to offer and is so desirable is we have 100-year-old oak trees out there, 100-year-old cypress trees, 100-year-old, uh, you name it. There are a lot of, and not even, or 80-year-old, whatever it is. We are an urban forest at this country club. We have something on the order of 700 and some trees on this site. So, um, so it has a, a huge history. The country club here has burned down more than once, um, which is, and thus we call our bar the Embers. Oh, nice. And um, do you know that was the land purchased by the from you know, the University of uh, I think it was, and during the depression, the university helped financially to keep the club alive. So there's a, there is an historic uh, connection to the University of Redlands. And the University of Redlands golf team plays here and practices here, as do the high school teams. We have, mm -hmm. every high school in our community has time, or their, their teams have time on our, our golf course for both match play and practice. Um, so it's a, it, to me, it's, a, it's not only a community service to do that, but we're hopefully growing that next generation of golfers as well. But this is a really desirable place to play golf. People, people love to come here, and and it's challenging and and just a whole lot of fun. And it's been a it's been a big part of Redlands, you know, and back to the 1800s. And, so. and we have some uh, members we're particularly proud of. Oh, well, we have we have one member, an honorary member right now, who's who's you know legendary, and that's Dave Stockton. He's he is. Um, arguably the best short game player and instructor in the country and and it's it's kind of fun Dave will occasionally bring he recently brought the woman who won the US Open last year here to do some coaching with her he just helped us build a short game facility here on the property that is very popular in a very short time with our members and I think will attract um, some some playing pros from around the country for that for was a week ago, right? Yeah. Last weekend. It was a couple weeks ago now. And um, so, yes, uh, we have we have some, we have, you know, not, not a bad thing to be known as the, the home of Dave Stockton. Yeah. He's a, he's a remarkable man, and, and I believe he's married to a woman who had been Miss California. So the, between the two of them, they're pretty, uh, pretty not notorious. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, so it's, it's, uh, it's been an interesting thing to, to move into this job as a woman. I should, and I, and that's a moment to say too that, that another thing that's uh, satisfying to me is how often I've had young women, some of them who I met when they were really young, mm -hmm. um, tell me that meeting me made them feel like they could do things. You're breaking ground for us. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, I, I hadn't thought about that side of it, but I, I hope so. I hope that it, it's inspirational to people who, who want to seek. I mean, that gender should have nothing to do with it. Had you not set out to do that? Not at all. I mean, this, this most recent post was a month or two ago. Well, maybe it was a In the fall. Okay. No, I actually... It's January now, so it's, it's really recent that you just, well, the, they just the, got their the, first woman president. And the compliment to me is that I serve with eight other men who 
asked me to do this. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a really good feeling, but it's not, um, maybe it's just because I'm comfortable with, I don't mind doing the leadership role. I don't mind calling the meetings or being, I don't know how to explain it even, but, but I'm not uncomfortable with that. And, um, and it's given me amazing opportunities. I and met others. Fascinating people. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, well, I hope so. And I, and, and I, and I enjoy seeing it. But it, to me, it's not about just being women or just, I mean, I, I think we are always better off when we have a well-balanced, diverse group of people discussing anything mm -hmm. or at the table for anything. And I, I mean that in every sense of the word, young people, older people, gender, um, walk of life, professional, sure. all of those things bring a richness to any discussion. So, um, and, and, may, and I'm, I like meeting people, and I'm a generalist, I like learning a lot about different things. I've served on a couple of interesting state boards where I suddenly got to learn, you know, um, I don't know. So now I'm now I'm learning about country clubs, <laughs> as in, in my second year on the board, and and it's it's a whole other it's a business, yeah. And and it's a business that has um, a lot of facets to it. I mean, we're a we're a sports facility, we're a restaurant, we're a uh, we're a social environment. Um, we are a as I mentioned, we're a forest. Mm -hmm. We're a bird sanctuary. Really? Oh my gosh. Um, I happen to really enjoy something I grew up, my parents were into, and um, you can't imagine how, there are sea terns that live on our, ocean terns that live on our golf course near our lake, and those little birds with the little fast legs that you usually yeah. see in the sand, well, we have a whole flock of them here. Last year we had um, a family of eight baby hawks that were born on our golf course, and it was such fun to watch these birds learn to fly and feed and that was kind of icky sometimes but um well just before um the interview started i went out there occupational hazard i started talking to the golf <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know if it's bad etiquette i know there's a time you know. have to be quiet but you don't seem to be swinging um and these women told me that they met each other here they've been golfing together oh. for years and they met here mm -hmm. and have formed this this relationship there are a lot of, of friendships that were forged on this on the golf course and um, people kind of tend to have some, you know, social interaction through that. It's great. You mentioned your parents. Um, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have questions about them, but I'd love to get, they're wonderful people, and I'd love to get their names on the recording, Chet and Sylvia Horseman, right. um, who have passed now, but really, uh, in their own way, made their own mark. But they moved to Redlands uh, in, in your the adulthood. 80s. Yeah? Yes, they, they did. And they, they were... Um, they were the reason, I guess, that I, my brother and I both are who we are, of course, because of my parents. And they were, I have what have, I mean, I, I feel like the traits that have been beneficial to me in my life are certainly from my parents and my, and my extended family. I was very lucky. 